Break down the elements of what made Hotline Miami 1 such a unique and stylish experience, it's clear what the sequel should be. The incredible synth-pop soundtrack, the white-knuckle Twitch gameplay, the dark and mysterious narrative, it's easy to point to these things and confidently say this is what made the game great and I want more. It seemed like a sure thing, but what I, and maybe Denaton Games, didn't realize was that Hotline 1 was a triumph because of its incredible balance of all these elements. Hotline Miami 2 makes the classic sequel mistake of design according to the law of sequels, which states, just make it bigger, that's it. Of course, forgetting that bigger is not always better, let alone smarter. It does feature worthwhile improvements, but fails to really push the game to a meaningful evolution or address Hotline 1's few problems. What was once an exhilarating, addicting experience left me exhausted, underwhelmed, and frustrated by a handful of bugs and glitches, at least on the PS3 version. Hotline Miami 2 offers more of the same, and maybe that's all Denaton felt they needed to do, but I just can't shake the feeling that it could have been more. Let's start with the story. Now, don't worry about spoilers, there's way too much to unpack in this video. Yet at the same time, there really isn't much to spoil, and that's the problem. So Hotline 1 excels at creating a fascinating and mysterious world, and creating it very quickly. Once the dust settles, the actual story, especially its handful of endings, is immensely underwhelming. However, the mystique of the world of Hotline Miami was still an incredible accomplishment. What would have otherwise just been a neat, retro-style, dual-joystick shooter was something much, much more. Now, I know a lot of people are going to assume that because I didn't like Hotline 1's grand conclusion, I just didn't understand it, which isn't true. I just reject Denaton's nihilistic anti-narrative conclusion or their cop-out political underground story, both at face value and as a waste of potential given their incredible ability to create fascinating and curious worlds. So as far as I was concerned, what Hotline 2 needed most was a better story. Now, inarguably there's more story, but if you're hoping for a sense of closure or even a feeling of commitment from the storytellers, then please don't bother. Hotline 2's huge cast of characters and scattershot timeline certainly had me confused throughout, but not interested, not curious. It was too chaotic, the many, and rather long, story sequences offered no allure beyond this will eventually have context. Furthermore, characters all talk with very simple language. None of them really has any character. Hotline 1's mysterious sequences had a structure, but lacked meaning, and I was hungry to uncover that meaning. The giant, sprawling story of Hotline 2 failed to hold my attention or deliver a satisfying conclusion. Though the attempt at a compelling story seemed pretty genuine, I did get the sense that there was a lot of thought put into this game's arc, an improvement over Hotline 1's endings which to me felt like complete afterthoughts. Unfortunately, the justification for this mess seems to be that everything is meaningless and nothing really matters, or the developers scoffing at the very idea that a video game needs to tell a story. For this, I really feel the weight of Denaton on my back. Their imagined gravitas making me feel like turning the gun on myself so that I can finally stop the incessant rolling of my eyes. All that energy wasted for the sake of nihilism. Some people can dig it, but it does nothing for me. At least the core gameplay is still fun. It wasn't until I replayed Hotline 1 that I realized how much faster, tighter, and better looking things are here in the sequel. The environments and enemies are more detailed and varied. The neon trimmings are more spastic and colorful, and picking up and tossing weapons is remarkably tighter. Though the story's conclusion failed to satisfy me, that final stretch, which of course I'm not showing here, was an absolute visual feast, poetry in motion. And the combat is as fun as ever. Thanks to tighter controls, you can shoot, smash, throw and grab weapons as fast as your fingers can move. Unfortunately, the action is so hamstrung by the law of sequels mindset of more, more, more. Most damning are the level designs, which are often very linear and expansive to a fault, undermining Hotline 1's delicate balance of rewarding careful planning and quick thinking when things go sideways. This jump to linear punishes the playing it fast and loose approach that was so fun in the first game. Levels here in the sequel feel less like playgrounds for reckless abandon and more like second-rate stealth missions. Levels go overboard with enemies, eliminating the don't stop for nothing attitude I enjoyed so much in the first game. Constantly, I was forced to rely on luring them into a bottleneck, which just isn't as exciting. 
And large rooms are a problem when you can't see enemies blasting you from off screen, even with the extended look. Levels are also lousy with windows. Cheap shots from across the arena are too common. The obvious solution is, of course, to blind fire right back through those windows, but what's the fun of shooting dudes off screen? How am I supposed to keep my combos going that way? But Hotline Miami's biggest enemy returns for the sequel. Those goddamn doors. Constantly blocking gunfire or knocking down enemies I meant to kill. God, what I wouldn't give for a shotgun strong enough to blow those damn things off their hinges. It would also probably solve the problem of dogs and people glitching out near them. Spinning in circles forever, getting stuck in door frames, becoming unkillable. I can only speak for the PS3 version, but these glitches happened constantly. I didn't test this on every level, but I was also able to walk outside of stages at a restart. Certain death animations would hitch the game, and twice the game hardlocked my system at the end of the 12th level. Replaying that level three times in a row was a grueling experience, and that's sort of the point here. Bigger rooms are harder, harder levels take longer, and longer levels make the game feel like a slog. Part 1 worked in small bursts, those last few levels were definitely an endurance, but that felt like a natural progression of difficulty. Hotline 2's excesses and frequent glitches sap most of the fun out of a prettier, flashier, and tighter controlled game. By now I'm sure you've heard the mask system has been revamped. Each level has you playing as different people with their own small collection of variants to choose from. I like these changes well enough. Having to adapt to a new playstyle between chapters and levels was neat, but it really wasn't much. A character that doesn't use guns. A character that only uses his gun. The Ice Climber twins packing a pistol and a chainsaw. It's cold comfort that these were the most meaningful changes in Hotline 2. When seen in conjunction with the massive levels, it stands to question why a co-op mode wasn't included. The soundtrack is another great collection of rad tunes. Once again, Moon is one of the many highlights. I've been following his work since Hotline 1, and Kixotic might be my favorite piece of his, and I was so excited to see it here. Though the game froze twice on me, it was the level with Carpenter Brute's masterpiece, Rolling Mobster, so replaying that level three times wasn't so bad. Magic Sword's The Way Home and Magna's Divide were also standout tracks, as well as, of course, anything by Perturbator. A misstep was the music used during the game's many story sequences. Hotline 1 used music to inform the audience it was talking time. The fly-infested den of mask-wearing creeps, your apartment, the post-mission snack on the way back home, each had their own punchy, immediately recognizable themes. Only one character has a theme song in Hotline 2, and if the other characters and settings had their own themes, I definitely didn't notice. A missed opportunity. If Hotline 1 left you wanting more, then I guess you got it with Hotline 2. It does feature some incredible improvements over its predecessor. Like I said, the controls are super tight, and for a retro-inspired aesthetic, they definitely got themselves a prettier game. However, the other changes feel unsubstantial, or push it in a direction that doesn't really work when you leave the gameplay largely unchanged. Around the time Hotline 2 was first announced, Denaton stated that this would be the final game in the series. If this is their vision of the series at its creative peak, I say that's the smartest decision they could have made.